Hello and welcome to our online time of Bible teaching, prayer and praise for Dean and Lostock Churches on Sunday the 24th of January 2021. We're going to begin our time meditating on the wonderful love of God. 1 John chapter 4 verse 10 says this. This is love. Not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son as an atoning sacrifice for our sins. God's love for us when we trust in Jesus is guaranteed because it doesn't depend on us and how much we love God. It depends on his great love for us. He's the one who started it. He's the one who guarantees it. He's the one who gives it to us through Jesus. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you for your great love for us. We pray this morning, whatever we're going through, with all of the challenges of life at this time, with this lockdown carrying on, and all of the difficulties we face, whatever they might be, may we be assured of your love for us in the Lord Jesus. Would you speak to us from your word, strengthen us, encourage us, and give us your joy as we worship you together. In Jesus' name. Amen. We're now going to go to our first song about the wonderful love of God. Here is love vast as the ocean. Why not sing out loud if you can at home. Well, in our discipleship challenge groups, we've been looking at 1 John so far this term. Uh, just to say, if anyone would like to join in, this is really the main place of gathering together, talking to each other, encouraging each other, building each other up. And there are around 90 people involved in our groups on all different times of the week. Do get in touch with me or with the church office if you'd like to join in. Anyway, as many of you will know, we've been in 1 John, and 1 John chapter 1 verses 8 and 9 say this. If we claim to be without sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just, and will forgive us our sins, and purify us from all unrighteousness. So if there's a promise from God, if we're open and we confess our sins, he will forgive us. It is a right thing for him to do because Jesus has died for us on the cross. 
And so it's right now for us to confess our sins in the words of the confession. Most merciful Father, our Creator and Judge, we acknowledge and confess that we have sinned against you in thought, word and deed. We have not loved you with all our heart. We have not loved our neighbours as ourselves. We earnestly repent and are truly sorry for all our sins. For your Son, our Lord Jesus Christ's sake, forgive us and strengthen us to serve and obey you in lives wholly renewed by your Spirit, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. May God, who loved the world so much that he sent his Son to be our Saviour, forgive us our sins and make us holy to serve him in the world, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Well, we're now going to continue in our new series in the book of Romans. Chris Dewhurst Taylor from Dean Church will bring us our reading and I'll be preaching. As we come to God's word now, let's pray and ask God to speak to us. Our Father in heaven, we thank you for your precious word. We thank you for what we've seen in the last few weeks about how powerful it is. And so we pray that your word today will work in power in our hearts. Help us to trust in you and equip us to serve you in this life. In Jesus' name. Amen. The reading is from Romans chapter 1 from verse 16. For I am not ashamed of the gospel, because it is the power of God that brings salvation to everyone who believes, first to the Jew, then to the Gentile. For in the gospel the righteousness of God is revealed, a righteousness that is by faith from first to last. Just as it is written, the righteous will live by faith. The wrath of God is being revealed from heaven against all godlessness and wickedness of people, who suppresses the truth by their wickedness. Since what may be known about God is plain to them, because God made it, has made it plain to them. For since the creation of the world, God's invisible qualities, his eternal power and divine nature, have been clearly seen, being understood from what has been made, so that people are without excuse. For although they knew God, they neither glorified him as God, nor gave, him th gave thanks to him. But their thinking became futile, and their foolish hearts were darkened. Although they claimed to be wise, they became fools, and exchanged their glory of the immortal God for images made to look like the mortal human being, and birds, and animals, and reptiles. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Cast your mind back to January 2020, exactly 12 months ago. Imagine if you were offered the coronavirus vaccine, one that worked, that was reliable, at that time, 12 months ago, when coronavirus was confined to China and even the Wuhan district, as far as we knew at that time. We'd had new diseases before. They hadn't been as bad uh, they hadn't spread when they were in China. They hadn't spread that much beyond China. Hadn't gone global. Would you have wanted to have the vaccine? Maybe some people would have said, yeah, just as a precaution, why don't I? It's available. I think the majority of people would have said, oh, no, thank you. You know, I mean, I, I don't know that much about this disease or how dangerous it is. I've had it a little bit on the news. It's something going out on the other side of the world. And, uh, you know, I... I just think it's a bit inconvenient to have to go and get a jab and I don't really like injections and things like that. Compare that to today when people are offered the vaccine. The vast majority of people want to take it up, don't they? One of our church members it works in IT for an NHS trust and was saying 
people are just booking up like crazy when a new slot, a menu of hundreds of slots becomes available. They're all taken within 10 minutes on the online booking system for people who work for that trust. So there's great demand now. What's made the difference in the space of a year? Seeing how serious this thing is. Seeing that everyone needs to be saved from it. Seeing that this is affecting everyone in the whole world. Seeing this is a deadly disease and we need to be kept safe. And so every adult, thankfully, in this country is going to be getting the vaccine and we are thankful for that. It gives us hope of a better future. Well, as Paul begins his letter to the Romans and really gets into the meat of it now as we get through chapter 1, he's making a point a bit like this about the gospel of Jesus, God's message for the world. Because he's saying that everyone in the world needs this message, just like everyone needs the vaccine. Everyone needs it because it's a message that saves, that rescues. We heard last week, it brings salvation, the power of God for salvation. It saves from something even worse than death, as we're going to see. This is why the gospel of Jesus is so important. So many people in our country today say, well, I don't think I really need Jesus. I think my life is fine without him. God's message says, no, your life is not all right without Jesus. You're in great mortal danger. You're in trouble even though you don't realise it. If you did realise how much you need saving, you would run to Jesus. Remember, Paul is writing to Christians, the Christians in Rome, and so these are people who have already trusted in Jesus. They have already been saved from this great danger we're going to hear about. But he wants them to get on board with him to bring this message to the wider world, beyond Rome to the Roman Empire, even beyond there to the barbarians. And so as we hear this message, if we're people who've trusted in Jesus, we don't need to fear the thing that we've been saved from, because if we're trusting in Jesus, we have already been rescued. But this will show us why everybody in the world needs to hear this message. So this is our big question. What actually is it? What do people need saving from? If we get that, we'll get why everyone needs this. We'll see that we see this um, in verse 18. This is where the answer first comes. The wrath of God is being revealed from heaven against all the godlessness and wickedness of people who suppress the truth by their wickedness. So here it is in a, in a summary. The wrath of God against humans who deny his truth. That is what every human being needs saving from. That's what the gospel of Jesus is there to save from. Now the word wrath means God's right anger. Now the fact is, God is angry with the human race because of how we have treated him. We need to let that sink in for a moment. That is not an aspect of God's character that we think about very often, is it? But it's clear here and throughout the Bible, God is angry. His wrath is revealed against people. We do need to be careful not to think that God is angry in the way that we human beings get angry. I mean, when we experience anger, often it kind of bubbles up inside of us and it can blow over the top and uh, we, can, we can have a fit of rage or our anger can be out of control. Well, not so with God. God's anger is controlled, it is settled, but it is proportionate to the evil that has been done. It is not an uncontrolled rage. It is not random or focused at people who don't deserve it or some people and not other people. God does have a right anger. It's a part, actually, of his good character. It's a part of his holiness. I mean, imagine this. Imagine there's a great atrocity, perhaps a mass shooting or a really evil act that makes the news headlines and it's just atrocious. Well, if God just stood by and didn't care and was indifferent to that, we would not say that God is good. A truly good person does care when a great evil is done. 
And so we can see God's wrath against evil, God's wrath against the evil of human beings, is actually a part, an expression of his good and holy character. Romans 1 tells us that we human beings have rebelled against God in the most serious way, and that is why every human being deserves God's wrath. Well, what is it that makes God angry? Let's look again at verse 18. The wrath of God is being revealed from heaven against all the godlessness and wickedness of people who suppress the truth by their wickedness. So God is angry at at wickedness, at godlessness. What does that actually mean? Well, the key part of it is there at the end, who suppress the truth by their wickedness. That is the heart of what we've done wrong. Let me give you an illustration of what it means to suppress the truth. Here is a ball. Um, This is one from our garden. We sometimes have this at the beach. And um, if you're in the sea, you can push it down under. You might want to hide it from someone and pretend it's not there. Where's the ball gone? Well, it's floating in the surface. That's obviously what it naturally does. It's a big, hollow plastic ball. If you push it under water, it'll pop straight back up again unless you keep pushing it down. And Paul is saying it's like that with the truth about God. The truth of God is a clear reality for everyone to see, but human beings suppress it. We push it away. We want to live our lives without God. And that is the biggest thing that God's wrath is directed against. Paul says here, the truth of God is plain for everyone to see. So actually, this is fair. Everyone is guilty of this. Uh, This is our second point. God's truth is plainly shown so that people are without excuse. Let's read verses 19 and 20 to see this. Since what may be known about God is plain to them, because God has made it plain to them. For since the creation of the world, God's invisible qualities, his eternal power and divine nature, have been clearly seen, being understood from what has been made, so that people are without excuse. So Paul is saying God has made the world and this truth is plain for every human being to understand and see. Imagine the um, NASA Mars space rover, okay? A little kind of trolley with lots of cameras on it and other gadgets on Mars. And it goes around looking for things and sending pictures back to Earth. Well, imagine it sent a picture back to Earth of four bricks. Four bricks not put there by people, stacked up, one on top of each other. Well, the whole media would go absolutely crazy. The world would go crazy. Wow, there must be intelligent life on Mars. I mean, how else could you have four bricks, one stacked on top of the other? And yet look at our world and how slow we human beings are to recognize that there is a creator God who we depend on. Our world in all of its beauty, all of the intricacy of the design, the way in which it fits together perfectly, the way in which the universe is perfectly balanced and ordered to create the conditions for life. How can anyone think there is no greater power who has designed this and put all of this together? The universe clearly points to the existence of a creator God. And the Bible here says that people are without excuse The evidence is clear, there is a God. And yet, and yet, our third point, people deny the Creator and worship created things instead. We see this in verses 21 to 23. For although they knew God, they neither glorified Him as God nor gave thanks to Him, but their thinking became futile and their foolish hearts were darkened. Although they claimed to be wise, they became fools and exchanged the glory of the immortal God for images made to look like a mortal human being and birds and animals and reptiles. Imagine an eight-year-old boy, let's call him Wilbur, and Wilbur has loving parents. They've given him everything he needs from the day he was born, and he has plenty of food, clothes, a lovely bedroom. They've given him lots of toys, 
and his parents have given him two special toys. They are giant, cuddly minions, okay? These things are nearly as big as himself, and he got them from his parents on his last birthday. Imagine if one day Wilbur turns around to his parents and say, I don't want you to be in charge anymore, Mummy and Daddy. I don't, I don't want you, just, just get away from me. Don't, don't talk to me anymore. I don't want to know you. That would be wrong, wouldn't it? What if Wilbur then said, I know, this minion is going to be my mummy and this minion is going to be my daddy. They're going to be in charge. Minions, you can tell me what to do today. Go away, mummy and daddy. The next morning he goes down to breakfast. His parents have laid it out. And he says, ah, oh, Frosties, thank you so much, minions, for giving me my favourite breakfast. Well, that would be terribly wrong, not only to push his parents away, but to pretend that the gift from his parents are actually in charge and actually the providers. Well, hopefully Wilbur will grow out of this before long. But can you see, it's a small example of what the human race has done with God. Verse 23, they exchanged the glory of the immortal God for images made to look like a mortal human being and birds and animals and reptiles. Can you see the injustice of it? Can you see this rightly makes God angry? Not only pretending that God doesn't exist, but taking things that God has made and given to us and worshipping them in the place of God. Now, we might say, we don't really do that in this country today. Well, actually, some people do literally bow down to images and idols of created things. But I realise most people don't. And yet everybody worships something. It is the biggest thing in life that you're living for. Many people worship money, thinking of money as a great provider. If I just work harder to get more money, then I'll, I'll have more of what I need and I'll be safe and secure. A family is another big one, isn't it? Actually, if we put family in the number one spot in our life and say, family is where my greatest joy and satisfaction is, family is where my security is, family is the biggest thing we're living for then we're putting that in the place of God and worshipping a gift rather than the giver. Of course, family, money is to be received as a good gift from God. I'm not saying these are bad things. And yet when they're put in the place of God, we end up worshipping them, them instead of God. We can do that with the idea of a comfortable life. We can do that with sport. We can do that with pursuing a career. We can take good things that God's given us and put them in the place of God and start to worship them instead of God. And that is what is so wrong. Well, if we're, if we're honest, we know that we have done that sometimes. And so we deserve God's wrath. But of course, if we've trusted in Jesus, we have been saved from it. Another example of doing this exchanging the truth of God and worshipping a created thing instead of a creator is if we were to say, well, um, I don't really like exactly the way the Bible's talking about God because it, it doesn't fit very well with me. You know, I don't like the idea of anger, so I'm just going to think of a God who only ever does kind things and is kind all the time. Or, um, you know, I don't really think sin is that much of a problem. I don't think God is too bothered about sin. I mean, why should he care about what humans get up to? Well, actually, what we've done there is reinvent God in our own human image. So basically, we've created an idol to worship, an image of God made after the image of a human being that we swap as a substitute for God and worship that idea instead. Well, that is, again, rebellion against God, which is the greatest offence towards him. Well, all of us are guilty here, and that is why the gospel of Jesus is such good news. Chapter 1, verse 16, For I am not ashamed of the gospel, because it is the power of God that brings salvation, that saves, that rescues everyone who believes. And now we've seen what the gospel rescues from. It rescues from the right anger of God, his wrath which every human being deserves. God has shown it plainly. People are without excuse. 
and yet we've denied the Creator and worshipped created things instead. Well, as I've said, if you're trusting Jesus, take comfort that he has rescued us from what we deserve. Maybe you listen to this and you're not sure about Jesus. You're not sure whether you've really put your trust in him. Well, now would be a good time to do that as we see how much we need saving. And all of us need to realise how much the world needs this good news. Let's get on board with the mission of spreading this message in every way we can, in whatever way God has enabled us today to contribute to the advance of his good news. Look how much every single human being in this world needs the good news of Jesus. Let's pray. Lord God, we thank you for the gospel of Jesus Christ, which saves us from your right anger, which we deserve. Please help us to put our trust in him and to know that if we've done that, we are safe in you. And please help us, Lord, to play our part in bringing this good news to people around us and around the world. In Jesus' name, Amen. Let a faith rise up and sing Of the great and glorious King You are strong when you feel weak In your brokenness complete Shout to the north and the south Sing to the east and the west Jesus is Saviour to all New Year congregations in the Methodist Church celebrate all that God has done in the covenant service, affirming that we all give our lives and choices to God. At the heart of that service, John Wesley's covenant prayer is said. A jewel in Methodist liturgy, it has been compared by some to a set of New Year resolutions, but ones that emphasise the importance of doing and being as much as believing. But more than that, the prayer represents a commitment to being a disciple and putting God first in our lives and in everything about our lives, what we do, what we say and who we are. 
It is both a surrender to and a trust in God. The final few words are a gracious reminder. You are mine and I am yours, emphasising that we don't pray and live just in our own strength, but in God's. So join me in saying, I am no longer my own, but yours. Put me to what you will, rank me with whom you will. Put me to doing, put me to suffering. Let me be employed for you or laid aside for you, exalted for you or brought low for you. Let me be full, let me be empty, let me have all things, let me have nothing. I freely and wholeheartedly yield all things to your pleasure and disposal. And now, glorious and blessed God, Father, Son and Holy Spirit, you are mine and I am yours. And the covenant now made on earth, let it be ratified in heaven. Amen. Acknowledging again that we don't pray in our own strength, let us continue in prayer. Lord God, help us to clear space in our lives this morning where your Holy Spirit can grow and produce fruit worthy of our great calling. To take away from us those things which cause hurt to others and hurt ourselves. Plant seeds of joy and peace that love might grow and be shown as we live in harmony with others. We thank you, generous God, for the world in which we live. We praise you for the beauty of the seasons with the varied opportunities which they provide to enjoy creation. We give thanks for night and day, rest and sleep, and a time for play and work. We give thanks for people, each created in your image, yet also wonderfully different. We give thanks for Jesus, who welcomed all and sought out the lost, and died on a cross to show your great love for us all. Amen. Lord God, in the darkness of winter and in the darkness of our broken world, let the light of Jesus shine to give us courage and hope. Light up our hearts as we praise you and our minds as we hear you and respond to your world. Give strength to those who seek to bring your light into the dark places of our world. Bless those who are called to serve in conflict zones. Give wisdom to the politicians and the world leaders who neg negotiate to bring about reconciliation. Strengthen all of those who work to protect the vulnerable and show compassion to all lo those lives who live lives have been whose lives have been subject to the physical and spiritual distress. We pray that your Holy Spirit would work in us to help us to serve you day by day. Give us eyes to see you at work in our lives and those around us. May the joy of your salvation burn brightly in our souls that your lost children would be drawn closer to you. Amen. We pray for our world, which through the power of modern media is revealed daily to us in all its violence, disaster and shallowness. You have put its care in our future in our own hands, and so we pray for a tireless striving for peace between the nations, a common realisation of the catastrophic dangers posed by climate change, and the sharing of the burden to support the poor and underdeveloped regions. We remember and pray for all agencies and charities involved in bringing aid, order and relief to so many worldwide conflicts and disaster areas. And we pray that through their workers' time and talents, they may be seen as the hands of Christ at work in our very midst. Amen. And we pray for the people of the USA as they begin a new period in their democratic life with the inauguration of President Joe Biden. God of mercy, the United States is in a time of great transition. With all the injustice and the fears in our world today, we ask that you inspire their new leadership and guide them promoting a government that upholds protection, protects human rights, and justice for all its citizens, regardless of race, class, gender or religion. Move and inspire the new president and his team to guard the most vulnerable in their society 
for their tears are your tears. The pain is your pain. Their suffering is your suffering. Amen. We pray for all in our communities of Dean and Lostock during these COVID-19 days. Our families, friends and neighbours, our work colleagues. We remember especially and pray for those who fear for the future through financial worries, through unemployment, through addictions and through family breakdowns. And ask that all these concerns, your Saviour Jesus, can be offered as the real hope on which shattered lives can be rebuilt. We pray that in all things, whether in difficulty or in celebration, that our nation reflects anew on our common inheritance of freedom, justice and service, which has come down over the years and through the labour and sacrifice of so many people. Amen. And finally, we pray for our two churches. Keep before us the vision of the church leadership teams supporting communities where people of different back church backgrounds can work, work and worship together in harmoniously and where those who seek to know more about Jesus will find, find a welcome. Give us a clear understanding of the work you have set before us and a fresh commitment to your service in this new year. Give wisdom to our ministers and leadership teams and may our witness continue to grow. These and all our prayers we offer to you, Lord God, in the name of Jesus, our loving Redeemer. Amen. Now together, let us say the Lord's Prayer, the fellowship prayer that unites us all. Our, our Father, Father in heaven, heaven hallowed, hallowed be your name. name. Your, your kingdom, kingdom come, come. Your, your will be done, done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. Well, we're drawing to the end of our online time today. May I encourage you, uh, do get in touch Let's keep getting in touch with each other. It's great to have the, the groups on Zoom, the discipleship groups, to do that on a weekly basis, but I know not everyone can or particularly prefers to connect in that way. So let's think of those who are missing and pick up the phone and give them a ring and encourage one another in this uh, rather dark and wet month of January and as the lockdown carries on. Let's conclude with a final prayer of blessing. The peace of God, which passes all understanding, keep your hearts and minds in the knowledge and love of God and of his Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son and the Holy Spirit, be among us and remain with us always. Amen. Mm -hmm.